Hey, welcome to the podcast. My guest this week is Captain Sterling Gillum. He is the director down at the National Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, Florida. Awesome museum. He is a former naval aviator. We talk all about his career. We talk about landing on boats and a lot more. We were able to go down there with E3 Aviation, shoot some amazing content and segments down there. We have a whole host of just amazing uh, insights to the museum and things that are going on from being able to hold General Doolittle's grade sheet when he was getting checked out to go bomb Japan. It, and being able to actually see that and hold my hands was incredible. So if you're looking for some great content, a great community, and some amazing discounts, check out E3 Aviation Association. I have that link down below. Again, that's the crew that shot this entire video you're going to watch. So some great stuff there. But Sterls is an amazing individual with quite a, an impressive career. I think you're going to enjoy his podcast. Before we get rolling into that, as I always mention, thanks to my Patreon supporters. If you're looking for ad-free podcasts, early access, and access to There I Was stories, join us over on Patreon. And if you like this content, make sure you're following along on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You actually can click to follow the show. That's a big metric that feeds the algorithms, as well as leaving ratings and review. So if you are enjoying this content, please make sure you're following the show over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. That really helps me out and lets me keep creating this content. That being said, let's jump into the episode with Sterls. What's up, E3 members? Excited to be sitting here with Captain Sterling Gillum who's the director of the National Naval Aviation Museum here in Pensacola, Florida. We're gonna talk about your career. We've talked a good bit and we've seen some amazing things here. I think we've just scratched the surface, uh, which has been awesome that you've lent your team out to us to be able to just capture some of this history and talk about it. But today I wanted to talk a little bit about you because 1,307 carry arrested landings now. Uh, you have quite a steep career and I wanna just kind of peel back the onion and talk about you a little bit and how you got sitting in this seat today and what a day in the life is. Well, we're your kind to do that. And first off, it's been great to host E3. Phenomenal opportunity for the museum and we hope you'll actually get an opportunity to visit, uh, your membership can visit in person. Absolutely. Excited about that. So anyway. How, how, did, how did you get into the seat today? How, I mean, this is kind of a weird, I would not say weird, this is a different path than most aviators once they leave Agreed. their career. So Agreed. how did that happen? So, and we'll talk Navy career here in a bit, but I finished my 30 years in the Navy, uh, retired in the D.C. area, uh, and was working in the private sector. And a friend of mine called who had been the executive officer of the base here and had said that the longtime director of the museum, Captain Bob Rasmussen, was retiring and that I should consider uh, taking the job. Thought long and hard about it, ended up putting an application uh, and became the fourth director of the National Naval Aviation Museum back in November of 2015. So I'm in year seven of career three and I've been granted a wonderful midlife gift to come be the director of this museum. As you might imagine, as a knuckle-dragging naval aviator, I had some trepidation about <laughs> becoming a museum professional. Um, I, I think I finally understand what my curator does. I'm not sure I can spell archivist, but what I've been granted is this opportunity to tell the remarkable story of 111 years of naval aviation, not only the wonderful flying machines that the Navy has flown since 1911, but the fascinating, remarkable, inspiring stories of the men and women that comprise naval aviation, Marine Corps, Navy, Coast Guard. It's been a, quite a journey. Been some bumps along the way. I'll, I will say this: the Navy. Yeah, I can the, imagine. My 30 years in the Navy was an embarrassment of riches. I got to see and do things a young kid from Eastern North Carolina could have only dreamed of. But in spite of having some pretty neat jobs in the Navy, this has by far been the most complex and nuanced job uh, that I've ever had in my adult life. That's interesting here because again, we're going to dig into your Navy career, uh, and you did a lot of things. So to hear you compare what you did in the Navy to how nuanced and how, I guess, challenging this job is, is, is fascinating for me to hear that. I wanna say COVID, that's obviously been a big thing that people have heard about in the news or right. experienced in the right. past couple of years. How has that impacted your job here? Well, I'll say this, running a public attraction in the middle of a pandemic is not for the weak of heart, 
like everybody else, when the pandemic first hit in the, the spring of 20, we closed for 197 days. We continued to work and we had the benefit of being on a 60 acre campus with over 400,000 square feet of enclosed exhibit space. So it was pretty easy to socially distance my relatively small government staff. Obviously the volunteers who are a little bit older, we're very mindful of them, but we worked hard to get open and we were the first Navy museum and there are nine museums in the Navy's enterprise to reopen and we reopened uh, in September of 2020 and we were the first Navy museum to reopen uh, by about 10 months. The next museum to reopen was Memorial Day weekend 2021. And I'm very proud of what the staff did during that time frame. We continued to improve the museum. We took the downtime to repaint, redo some things, right. rehack some stuff. The only thing we were missing was patrons. And we've been open 362 days a year ever since. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. We got a couple good segments talking about sure. the various exhibits that are going on here and how people can get out and really you gotta come see it for themselves because yeah. it is a phenomenal campus. But I wanna jump into where did you get the bug for flying? How did you get into the Navy? So it was a chance encounter to be uh, honest with you. I was going to school uh, in North Carolina. I was a sophomore at East Carolina University, go Pirates. <laughs> studying to be an accounting major. And in between economics classes, my sophomore year, I'm wandering through the student union and encamped in that student union, like they're encamped around student unions around the country, was a Navy recruiter showing a video of airplanes coming and going off aircraft carriers. I was young enough, naive enough, and beguiled enough by the video to stop and talk. And I ended up having one interview in college that was with the United States Navy. I graduated with a GPA that we will not discuss in this interview. <laughs> Jumped in my 1982 Pontiac Sunbird here and drove to Pensacola, Florida and went through Aviation Officer Candidate School, which was the commissioning source. If you may have seen that Richard, that cheesy Richard Gere movie, Officer and a Gentleman, that was the program I went through. Minus Deborah Winger and a drill instructor much meaner than Lou Gossett Jr. But I, I finished that, got commissioned, went to flight school up the street at Whiting Field, was lucky enough to select a jet pipeline, uh, went to Beeville, Texas, where I got my wings of gold. Beeville, Texas is now a Texas state prison, courtesy of Base Realignment and Closure Commission 93. Convenient. Yeah, so there are a lot of folks that uh, are probably still incarcerated at the Chasefield Correctional Facility where I got my wings. I got orders to fly the EA-6B Prowler. Uh, I remember vividly the commanding officer of the VT-24 came up. Congratulations, Lieutenant uh, Junior Grade Gillum. You've been selected the EA-6B Prowler. And I go, well, what is that? Well, he goes, well, it's a carrier-based four-seat electronic attack airplane based in Whidbey Island. I go, well, where's that? <laughs> and so I jumped into the same uh, Pontiac Sunbird and uh, did Caddy Corner from southern, uh, southern Texas to Oak Harbor, Washington, where I spent the balance of the next 30 years flying the A6B Prowlers. Man, that's incredible. I want to jump, in, I'm going to peel back again because the commissioning source. So one, you bumped into a recruiter, you saw a video, the hook was in. What, what took place between that moment and actually coming down here to Pensacola to commission? Because I'm thinking Air Force, we have Officer Training School, right. ROTC, and the Air Force Academy. Those are the three commissioning sources. Now, the Aviation Officer Candidate School has gone away. It's now just a Universal Officer Candidate School. But the time, as you might remember from the movie, Aviation Officer Candidate School was focused directly on aviation. So you, you in addition to going through the standard Officer Candidate School, physical fitness, gunnery sergeants wailing on you just a right. smidge. You went through navigation, aerodynamics, meteorology, along with all the other aviation flight physiology. It was a 14 week program and it was it was cram packed if with you, stuff. Were you guaranteed a fly? I was, okay. I was guaranteed a pilot slot, assuming that I could finish. And that was the deal. If you wash out, you go home, no harm, no foul. And I might've been just a little bit of a late bloomer, uh, which is probably why I was at East Carolina. But I realized as I was leaving my hometown of Henderson, North Carolina, and headed to Pensacola, 
that I, I, I didn't want to come back to my hometown, tell Betwixt Leg and say, um, you know, this Navy thing just wasn't for me. So for the first time in 22 years, I actually bore down and started preparing and working hard. I spent a little time getting ready for officer candidate school. And stunningly, I get down here and having put a little preparation to it, results followed. I go, well, I could have learned that lesson a lot sooner than I did. But um, I tried to continue that work ethic in flight school and I was fortunate enough to do reasonably well. I did not have any flying experience, but it turned out to be reasonably aeronautically adaptable and enjoyed flying. I was, certainly wasn't the best flight student. There were plenty of students that were better, but I enjoyed it and I seemed to have a little bit of knack for it and more importantly, a passion for it. Yeah, the passion part's a big piece of when you're going through something that's a, cha a challenging program, a profession yeah. that you're seeking, having that passion, you have to have and that. And there's a lot of unknown. It was, as I look back, it was pretty uh, hubristic of me to think about landing aboard an aircraft carrier while I'm a sophomore at ECU. And I'll have to tell you, carrier qualification in, in flight school was a terrifying, <laughs> terrifying endeavor, but I remember it like it was yesterday we were operating out of Key West because it was winter time. Well, it was actually fall. And I remember that we were on the USS uh, Nimitz. And I remember that it was actually Halloween day because the catapult officer was wearing a gorilla mask uh, <laughs> when I went for my very first catapult shot. But it was an interesting time. But, but I, I, I stuck with it. And the Navy does a very good job of preparing you for the next level. If I had realized in 1980 where I would ultimately end up, I probably would have been so terrified I couldn't have done it. But it just took an incremental, very much like the Air Force, an incremental training, getting you ready for the next step. And then I look back 30 years later and I was very appreciative of the training and education that the Navy invested in me. And I'd like to think that they got some return investment on that. Out of yeah, it. Maybe a little bit. Uh, maybe. Maybe that. But I think it's a good point you make. I've talked about this a few times in some other episodes. You know, I think the Navy and the Air Force, most military, it's it's a structured program. There's always a syllabus for whatever right. program you're going through. Yes. And there's always a building block approach. There so is. show up for Air Force pilot training. The expectation, one, you've gone through initial flight screening, which right. they're going to put you through. Right. But they know you've never flown a T-6. Right. They're going to teach you how to fly the Air Force way. And it's up to you to put in the work on your side of the house, yeah. knowing the systems, knowing the regulations, and then the instructors are going to, give it their best to lend you these tips, tricks, and procedures to go out there and fly. It's a, that's a great point. And I had a lot of friends and peers that came into the Navy with some flight experience, but it quickly leveled out and it was just really based on your preparation and some level of aptitude, but preparation right. was a key key thing. Trust me, if, if I can land an airplane aboard an aircraft carrier, almost anybody can. But I I focused, and that was one of the traits that you learn in aviation of compartmentalizing and thinking about the matter at hand and not being distracted about that. If that was one part of the self-discovery, I understood that I had a pretty good knack for focusing on the task at hand and even in just trying to do it to an acceptable level. That's a, another big piece of it too, because I, I think I'm a, I'm a pretty solid average on a great day, right. uh, there are people who are much smarter than me. A lot of peers right. much smarter than me, much yep. more talented than me. But I think some of my success came from one, being able to figure out what, how to prioritize right. those tasks, then how to compartmentalize when need be, or to drive home, like really right. what's important to kind of read, read the room, if you will. Yep. Because again, you can build a rocket and right. send it to the moon, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to translate that and yeah. fly that rocket ship. One, one thing that worked well for me, one of my early instructors in primary goes, hey, don't focus ahead of need. Worry about the next graded event. You know, you can do a little bit of preparation beyond that, but worry about the next graded event. And that's been an organizing principle that I've used every day to include running this wonderful National Naval Aviation right. Museum that I'm proud to be the director of. Nearest alligator to the boat. That's yeah, exactly, and that's proven to be, and it, it served me well in uniform because other people were focused on other things and focusing on the matter at hand allowed me and the units that I happened to be in charge of to be more effective about the matter at hand, the task at hand. I was very proud about how that translated into operational success. Let's talk about operations a little bit. So jumping into the Prowler uh, initially, what were some of the initial couple of years like flying the Prowler? Well, I was uh, 
again, the Prowler is an electronic attack airplane. So if you weren't carrying ordnance, you didn't really carry forward firing ordnance other than the high speed anti-radiation missile. So as a pilot, I really kind of focused on being able to land the airplane, the commute to work. That's the catapult launch <laughs> and the recovery. I wanted to make sure that airplane got to and from the area of work, the battlefield, safely and effectively with the right amount of fuel and the right on time. So I, I focused on basics. And another huge, huge influence in my career is I became a landing signal officer. If you're familiar with that, landing signal officers are naval aviators who also serve as the people that get the men and women back aboard the aircraft carrier. They literally stand on the back of the deck. I'm wearing my paddle shirt today. <laughs> it goes back in the day before radios, you literally had paddles that you would wave at. That's given way to radios and optical landing systems, but the core principle of a safe and efficient recovery of airplanes is something that the landing signal officers were challenged with. So let's say we're aboard an aircraft carrier. Every fourth day, I would not fly that day, but would go out to the landing signal officer platform and work my way up to the ranks to safely get the air wing back aboard. You would start out waving, controlling your airplanes and then you would learn the other airplanes at the time. That was the F-14, the A-7, the A-6 Intruder, which gave way to F-18s and then Super Hornets. But I learned a lot about the business, the vocation of carrier aviation, not only just the landing, but the whole model, the whole choreography of safely launching and recovering in the most efficient use of time. Because if you think about it, warfighting effectiveness depended on your ability to get a number of airplanes airborne with ordnance, with gas, and then safely back aboard, get those airplanes turned around and launched again on the next combat sortie. So I, I became kind of a student of naval aviation thanks to being a landing signal officer. And I did that in various incarnations at a squadron. My sure duty was involved with training other people to land aboard an aircraft carrier for the first time. And then I became a wing landing signal officer, kind of in charge of the carrier's comings and goings. And then my final LSO gig was I uh, was the senior landing signal officer for the West Coast at Commander Naval Air Forces. And I got a chance to see and do things and not insignificantly fly a bunch of different types of airplanes because they wanted those LSOs proficient in other type model series. So when you were controlling them, you had an understanding of what was going on in that particular cockpit. So from a, form, from a foundational point of view, as a young lieutenant, 03, what a great opportunity for me to broaden my horizons in it. In a warfare community that was not as uh, operationally oriented as, say, a Hornet squadron right. or an F-14 squadron. I got a, a couple questions with sure. this, you know, because I'm used to my runway being fixed. Right. And I know where it is. Yours is moving. One, this is a simpleton question, but let's talk like carrier. That carrier is moving from point A to point B to point C. You're taking off, flying out, doing mm -hmm. operations. While you fly away, that carrier might or might not have moved. It will, it will have moved. So talk to me just like some admin pieces of like getting to and from the operating area and back. How right. does that all work? And then I would like to talk about the operations, just kind of the flow of launching, yeah. recovering jets. I mean, this is a... This is, a, this, is a, this is a whole thing in itself. Well, I hope you have enough uh, batteries <laughs> in your camera because it's, it's a fascinating conversation. And it's something we're still learning. My very, very last arrested landing, I was still learning and still grading myself to do it as efficiently and effectively as possible. But to your point, and I really believe this, you know, that's sexy to say you're a naval aviator, but that's just a small part of the business end of naval aviation, which is forward presence. Uh, strike delivery, uh, air defense, fleet defense, all those things that are catalyzed by being able to safely launch and recover. And the really, really cool thing about that runway that moves, it can go to the fight. And so to your point, you fly out to the ship, you fly, and let's say the ship is trying to transit from its home base in San Diego, California, or Bremerton, Washington, it's got to work its way across the Pacific and you're going to fly. So literally what we will do in cyclic operations is you'll launch um, and then you'll come back in about an hour and a half. 
that carrier will start moving in the direction that it needs to move. Now, if you're lucky, the winds are coming from the direction in which you're trying to head. So if you're trying to head west and the wind's out of the west, boom, you launch the 15 airplanes, uh, you steam a little faster, and you slow down for the recovery. If the winds are not favorable, and there's a misnomer, you really do need to have, it's nice that the carrier can steam in any direction, but if there's any natural wind there at all, you have to steam in that general direction such that on that angle deck, you minimize the crosswind. It's because it's hard enough already. A crosswind just makes it problematic to safely get aboard. And the same, same applies to the catapult shots that, that go to that. There, there are a lot of different variations of that. As an example, if the winds are not in your favor, but they're common, let's say it's five knots out of the east and you're trying to head west, the ship can do, if it's a nuclear aircraft carrier, can do something called a down recovery. So let's say you're trying to get 25 knots across the angle deck. There's five knots out of the east. Let's steam the ship 30 knots. Getting a 100,000 ton piece of metal yeah, on 30 knots requires Impressive. a lot of neutrons. <laughs> but now when you do the math, now you got 25 knots down the deck. So, it's, it's, so that's the versatility of aircraft carriers and having had the opportunity to literally sail around the, the globe and operate from aircraft carriers on every continent save Antarctica. Kind of, kind of one of the neat, neat features to carrier-based aviation. The ability to project American air power anywhere around the world yep. and relatively a moment's notice is, is yep. pretty impressive. I also, I'm, I'm curious when it comes to, so launch recovery, we know there's a lot of moving parts that are yep. going on there. I'd kind of like to talk about that a little bit because you, you hit on, you, you graded your landings, but that is something that legitimately happens on every single landing. Correct. Because from coming into, again, Air Force, we would call it initial starting out, to the break, to rolling out on final, that is being timed, that's being looked at, that's being scored, all the way down to catching the appropriate wire, or the, yes. the one of the wires, Correct. right? Can you talk me through how that, what that is and then why that's important? Well, we'll work backwards from the landing because you've got to land safely and you want to land the first time every time. Because if you don't land, and that could either be a, a thing called a bolter, where you land beyond the wires and your hook never has a chance to catch one of the wires, um, or you get waved off, which the landing signal officer that I just discussed said you're not in the appropriate parameters. The worst of those parameters is being too low. It, there's a saying in naval aviation, an airplane's built for a thousand and one bolters, but only one ramp strike. So you, you, there's merit to making sure the airplane is at the appropriate glide path and not below that glide path. Because to put it in perspective, a perfect approach to a modern day Nimitz class aircraft carrier, that tail hook is crossing the ramp, the, the stern of the ship with only 12 to 15 feet of clearance. And that's that's the tolerances, and that's steady deck. It's 12 to 15 feet or 12 to 15 inches? 12 to 15 feet. Yeah, which in a C state, depending on what it is, and that's what I was trying to get. Bow down, stern up. My buddy. Bow up, stern down. LSO explaining this to me as I was hanging on for dear life trying to understand it. But an experienced LSO, and I imagine be to that point, you have this. He knew the minute the plane rolled out on final based upon where the right. bow was, if it's going to go ahead and wave them Correct. off, go ugly early. Because by the time they're crossing right. the, the threshold, if you will, the bow can be coming up and slamming into well, the Well, and, and it's really the stern that you're interested stern. in. And, and so, Port, starboard, you know, yeah, we'll I mean, forgive yeah, you. Left, right, up, down. With that stern being up, now it reduces that hook to ramp. The optical landing system that you're looking at, it's gyro stabilized, so it can deal with some amount of sea state. At some level of sea state, even it won't keep up. But if the stern comes up and you're on that glide path, now that hook to ramp is uh, decreased. And the converse of that's not really great because if you go, this is the stern, and you go bow up, stern down, now if you're on a three degree glide path and the bow is one degree up, you're now hitting the deck at a four degree glide path and, and the airplanes are already taking a pretty good load factor from the catapult shot to the landing. Now with bow up, you're just hitting that deck that much harder and, in, and putting that much more fatigue life on an already fatigued airplane that's just gets beat to death. 
do you know day what, in and day out. Do you know what the rough like feet per minute at touchdown? Is? I know it probably varies, but I'm curious. You're about 700 feet per minute as your your rate of descent, and you're unlike the Air Force, you're not flaring. You're flying a constant airspeed read angle of attack right, right into the deck. And there's several reasons for that. You want to make sure you keep the power on the airplane just in case you miss the wire. You can go full power and get you know and get airborne again. And there's times, and this is just kind of the luck of the bounce, your hook will literally bounce over the wire. It's just boom, boom. It's called hook skip bolter. If the landing signal officers are nice, they'll recognize that and not ding you for it. But you can induce a hook skip bolter by being faster, little nose down, nose goes down, hook comes up, boom, boom. So totally. those are the type of Yeah, things. we're saying, hey, the, the, they might be nice and give you, or not ding you for that. Everything is getting scored and then, everything's graded and everything and is racked, uh, racked and stacked and presented in front of everyone, right? In front of everyone. When you're on deployment or in a workup, there's probably 100 pilots in the air wing. It's a little less now. We have less two-seat airplanes, but let's say it's 100 pilots in the air wing. Uh, everybody gets graded. It's like Major League Baseball. Somebody's got a 4-0 average and somebody's rocket last, and they'll end up having competitions in the, the top 10 ball flyers as we would use in the vernacular, the top 10 grades would get top 10 patches. And that performance, while all aviators are competitive people and human beings are competitive right. by nature, naval aviators are as competitive as anybody else, you're trying to do well. But the real benefit is when you're trying to do well, you're going to be better. You're going to get better. And that has a direct impact on combat efficiency, which is the main if we weren't worried about combat efficiency, we wouldn't grade a thing. And then ultimately safety, because you can imagine with those tolerances, with the deck moving around a little bit, or let's say the sun goes down, and now it's nighttime, and you don't have near the visual acuity, horizon reference, the consequences of landing low is, is self-evident. And you've seen probably yeah. some pretty pretty dramatic videos yeah. of, of ramp strikes, and, and they're not pretty in airplanes and people don't survive those well. You mentioned a little bit about the choreography. One thing is very easy to focus on the pilot, but one of the things that I very much enjoyed about carrier aviation, as I like to uh, describe it and as it was described to me, it's the world's largest and most complex team sport. There are literally hundreds of people on that flight deck, young kids right out of high school um, that are working on those airplanes 12 to 14 hours a day. And they're running around in different colored jerseys that delineate their different roles on that flight deck. And as the person who gave me that analogy, he was describing being a young lieutenant, feeling pretty bad in his A7 Corsair, taxing up the catapult. And he started looking around and he realized he was just a small part of this larger team that it's required to get those airplanes airborne and safely back aboard again. And, that, and that, that has stuck with me throughout my entire time in the Navy. And I was very lucky. I was uh, flying on and off the carrier at the tender age of 48. So I, I got to enjoy it for, for quite a while. And, it, and I've just, the longer I did it, the more appreciative I was for the opportunity that the Navy gave me. It's impressive to watch. I've never been on a carrier deck, but obviously you see the movies, you see the TV shows and what's happening. And I, I compare that to it, probably combat in F-16 right. when you're you know in the EOR and you got arming crews, you got crew chiefs, everyone right. around. There's a lot that's going on around the jet. If you touch the flight controls in F-16, like you can do some serious damage right. to someone if they're walking by in the wrong spot. And you know you throw this on a ship in a confined space. You got pitching decks, nighttime weather. It's, it's pretty a, it's a very hazardous spot. With the possible exception of people working offshore oil rigs. It's probably the most dangerous industrial environment on the, on the planet. You've got folks, you've got live ordnance, and you talked about everything's on the four and a half acres of the flight deck. And you could have 50, 50 airplanes on the flight deck <laughs> coming and going, loading live ordnance, jet fuel, exhaust. Um, it, it, it can be pretty sporty, but when it's done well, it's a thing to behold, and it and it just really, it really goes to kind of the ethos of naval aviation of getting this done and and being able to relocate 
from one area of responsibility to another to do the things that your nation is asking you to do in defense of this country.